Hello and welcome to Advanced Machine Vision Applications in the Food Industry. My name is John Sauls. I'm the owner of Vision ICS. This is a presentation I originally did for Vision Systems Design. Unfortunately, with their process, I was unable to uh, include my videos, so I decided to re-record it and post it here. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the food industry status, both uh, in general and uh, as it applies to machine vision. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about the Food Safety and Modernization Act and then also talking about vision applications in the food industry that we've been involved with. To start with a little bit about me, uh, my name is John Sauls. I'm owner and engineer for Vision ICS. Uh, we're a consulting company, primarily working with machine builders and systems integrators, uh, also with some end users, usually following the machines that we've built. Uh, I have 23 years of vision experience. Uh, we focus only on vision systems and have deployed over 700 systems. Uh, currently, approximately 20% of our business is in the food industry. That's not really by design, it's just kind of the way it worked out. So let's talk just a little bit about the status of the food industry. Uh, from an automation perspective, their industry is very similar to where pharmaceutical and medical device industries were about 20 years ago. Uh, in the case of, of big pharma medical device, uh, they had a lot of very manual processes. They were using uh, human beings instead of using automation. Uh, there was a push to uh, increase their production rates, uh, increase their profits by, by automating. At the same time, they were getting pressure from the government through legislation that was forcing them to automate their processes. So that was a very good time for uh, all of us automation geeks. Uh, we're kind of seeing that time with the food industry now. Uh, one of the things this chart doesn't show very well, that the industry is growing, uh, has been growing about 4.5% a year for a very long time, about 50%, uh, $1.4 trillion in sales annually, about 50% of that's at home, and 50% of that is dining out. Uh, one of the things this chart on the right does not show very well is um, about 2007, when we had the Great Recession, that 50-50 uh, number changed fairly dramatically, and we started eating at home. So all of the companies that we would talk about as being big food um, suddenly were flush in cash. Um, at the same time, there were a lot of us automation people that were, had been working in other industries that suddenly found ourselves with some time available and uh, the, the big food kind of snapped it up and started doing a lot more automation. Uh, about $70 billion of, of business a year is in the U.S. We are exporting significantly to the rest of the world, and you can see those numbers are uh, growing and have continued to grow um, around the world. Um, there is some legislation that is coming online, and we will talk about that later. Uh, there are also a lot of very aging uh, facilities, uh, manufacturing facilities and equipment. Uh, you should look at some of this stuff, and you would swear it's been around since World War II. Um, as those control systems fail and, and the need to be upgraded, we, we start to see more and more of that push from our customers. So about a decade ago, the food industry had, was really flush with cash. Uh, they, they had a big surge in dollars that were available to them. Um, what we're kind of seeing now is their sales are starting to slump a little bit, especially the large manufacturers, people who we might think of as being big food, um, you know, the, the big brand names. Uh, what's happening is there's kind of a consumer perception of quality that if you go with the smaller manufacturers, uh, the smaller names, that their products are inherently better or inherently more healthy. Uh, there, there's certainly debate available for that. Um, so what the large manufacturers are doing, they have all this cash available. Um, they're sucking up these tiny mom and pop type of producers uh, and then flooding them with cash to automate their lines and, and make them more productive while at the same time trying to maintain that small company image, uh, you know, via labeling or branding or whatever else. Um, so these companies all have some money. They're all pushing towards automation. Uh, there's also, you know, at the same time, consumers are demanding quality and uh, it's getting harder and harder to get employees to work in these manufacturing plants. Uh, just the number of employees that they need to do it are harder and harder to get. So that's really driving people to move towards automation and using vision as well. 
The next big driving force we have for automation and machine vision in the food industry has been the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, this is signed in 2011 by President Barack Obama. Uh, it's very similar to CFR 21 Part 11 uh, for the medical device and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this is a law that, uh, just like CFR 2111, uh, largely focuses on documentation, uh, that you document anything you're doing in your industry, that you're tracking any changes that you made to machinery, that you're uh, storing this information, uh, and then you're tracking all of your products. Uh, and it's really aimed at preventing any accidents, contamination, cross-contamination, things like that. Uh, they, they say as a part, in a positive way, that it focuses on multiple partnerships at multiple layers of controls and rules. Roughly translated, that means there's a lot of bureauc uh, bureaucracies that all have their hand in the bowl and they're all stirring it around. Uh, there are over 50 plus new rules. There are um, different large agencies, uh, you know, multinational, national agencies that are all also involved in this. Uh, it does have some fairly tight deadlines. Some of these deadlines have already passed. So if your company has not done anything for the Food Safety Modernization Act, you might want to get in gear. Uh, it is a very vaguely worded and confusing law. Uh, it's kind of typical. You have lawyers writing laws about control systems, which they know nothing about. Uh, if you read the law uh, in detail and depending on your interpretation, it could actually require that you track food from the time that it's in the field uh, as a grain of wheat on a stalk. You have to track that all the way through the harvesting process, through the mixing process, through the manufacturing process, uh, distribution right down to your plate, uh, which is, is largely impossible. So it's a little terrifying for people that the government could come and uh, enforce this law. Uh, it does specifically require uh, HARP-C controls. It's hazard analysis and risk-based preventative controls. Uh, the, the idea there is that you're preventing accidents from occurring. You could read that as vision systems. Uh, requires at least one uh, preventative controls qualified individual on your staff. You could read that as vision geek. Uh, so these are the lot, uh, part of what's pushing people to modernize their plants. So with that, let's talk about a few applications. We're gonna start off talking about track and trace. Uh, the first one you, that most of us are familiar with is barcode verification. Uh, typically what we're using these systems for is we're verifying that the package is the correct package before we put uh, product in it. So uh, for example, we wanna make sure our cereal box is the right cereal box before we put the cereal inside of it so that we know that we're getting uh, the right product to the consumer. Uh, and that's really largely based on allergens. For the most part, those are laser-based systems. Um, there are some new uh, camera-based systems that do a very, very, very good job, uh, arguably better than the laser-based systems, but you know that those guys can fight that out. For the most part, my company does not do a lot of barcode reading uh, just because the barcode readers, either they work or they don't. Uh, we do a little bit alongside a vision system uh, but that, that's kind of uh, a small part of our business. Um, the quality verification, this is something you're kind of seeing pushed back from Walmart. Uh, what they want to see is they do not want their personnel scanning barcodes multiple time because uh, that's costing them money. Uh, they also do not want their consumers scanning multiple times if they're going through the self-checkout lanes because uh, that's costing them customer satisfaction. Uh, so Walmart has pushed back on the industry. They are insisting that people have good print. Uh, and so you're seeing some quality verification systems, uh, some grading type systems uh, where we're just verifying, yeah, this is a, at least a B or better code and it's not messed up. And I have seen some really horrible uh, quality barcodes since I've been in the industry. Uh, the other one that we see a lot of is the date lot code verification. Uh, this is really tracking the product as it's made to make sure that it, it's, uh, which line was it produced on, uh, what date was it produced on, and you know when, when was it produced. So if something goes wrong, first of all, if they do a recall, you have a lot number, so they can you know, announce that the lot number is, is between this number and this number, and any of those, please return it to the manufacturer. If their printer is shut down and they're not printing good print, um, 
or, or really bad print, they get a whole lot more material back in those recalls than they want. Uh, the other one that you see is the expiration date. That's more for us human beings. We want to look at the product, say, yeah, the product's good. It hasn't expired like this one, which uh, I did the application a while ago, but it expired in 2014. If I see that on the package, I may not want to use the product. Um, the big problem that we have in the vision industry is that the tools that we have, the optical character verification and the optical character reading, uh, those are really intended for the semiconductor industry. And the semiconductor industry is uh, has extraordinarily good printing quality. They're, they're looking at, uh, for example, semiconductor wafers, where they print a number, a human readable number uh, with a laser, and that wafer is literally worth thousands of dollars. So if the vision system is a little confused about whether, uh, you know, a character on there is a, a letter O or a zero, they would rather reject it. They would rather push it out and make sure they have it correct. Uh, in our side, on the consumer side, you know, if we're looking at this example that we have here, um, you and I know that 05 is the month of May. We don't need to have it be precision, whether that's a zero or the letter O, uh, but the vision systems would still reject it. So what we kind of do on our side, uh, we have to do some detuning of those tools to make sure that they work more like a human being would. Now, this is probably gonna become less of an issue as we see more of the deep learning systems. We'll be talking about that later, but with the deep learning systems, they're getting smarter and smarter about being able to identify this information. This is more of an application that we kind of see uh, from our business. Uh, we see a lot more of the mixture where we're seeing human readable code alongside barcode. That's mostly when we get into the barcode reading. Um, this particular one, we're looking at a 2D barcode. And if you're not familiar with 2D, it is uh, a really cool technology. Uh, you can do, um, you can destroy like 40% of the code and still read it due to the built-in error correction and checking. Uh, it is a very, very cool technology. This particular one, they're actually embedding some of, of this information into the 2D code. So it's machine readable very, very quickly. And at the same time, it's human readable. Um, some of these lines, we're doing these at 300 parts per minute, which is kind of a normal speed. We do have a couple high speed lines that are about 1200 parts per minute. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of horsepower processing power to handle that. But one of the, I guess one of the problems we should mention with the 2D barcode, it is so robust. Some manufacturers have issues with it uh, where they're trying to um, look at the code and verify the code. And the problem is that the code never fails. For example, in the medical device industry, they have to have a certain failure percentage for their reporting. If you can't report zero, which means that you have to run products past it until you find one that fails. If it never fails, it's not acceptable. So you'll see some of the medical device manufacturers due to the government regulations and rules and laws, they're actually going to 1D barcodes because they get a certain failure rate and they prefer to have that number rather than allow a number of zero to go through. So one of the applications we're doing a lot of is uh, package verification, uh, where we're looking at the actual uh, characteristics of the package and identifying that the correct pack is on there. Um, this is an example of that where we're basically looking at uh, uh, cups of parfait and we're verifying that it is in fact parfait and it's not jello or something else. Um, so this is largely driven by allergens. You don't wanna tell people that uh, uh, you're giving them a peanut free product, for example, and then have uh, peanut butter in the product. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we have the correct packaging, the correct information. Most of that's driven by lawsuits, but you know, to a lesser extent by the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, so we're seeing this kind of thing uh, a lot where we're looking at the tops. Um, here's a more zoomed in app, uh, example of that same type of application. Uh, this is looking at, uh, in this particular manufacturing line, they, they bring the products through one cup at a time. And so we look at the top, top of every single cup and verify that the correct uh, label is on top of the package. In this case, they do not uh, have different bottoms on the cups. Um, so the only thing that really identifies what's inside of it is the packaging on the top. Now you can see this particular one has a, a 1D barcode available. Um, we're actually doing kind of a redundant check on this one. 
We're looking at the 1D barcode, and then we're also looking at graphical information in the label. Uh, the other thing that we're doing on this one that's a little bit different, uh, this manufacturer makes some products that are for the United States only market where the text on the, the label is all 100% English. And then they do products in Canada where they do English and French. So in this case, we're actually verifying that this is a French package by uh, looking at the words that are on the, the package and the word for vanilla in French uh, to verify that it's on there. On some of the other packages, we're also using the uh, uh, size of the cup. So if it's a, a four ounce cup, we're reading four ounce, the English units. Otherwise we're reading uh, 113 grams, which is the uh, metric units. This is another identification task. If, if you go and look at your, uh, next time you're out grocery shopping and you check out the bottoms of the cans, you'll notice most cans have these two letter codes. Uh, a majority of them do use these two dots and then the single dot, and then they have the two letters in between them. The two letters in between them are identifying uniquely what's in that package. And you can see this one, I've got them all lined up so that we can kind of read them and see what it says. Uh, but these actually are coming down the line. They can be any orientation. And what happens is most of the manufacturers store their cans in silver, is what they call it. So they'll be on pallets loaded with cans of product with no labels on it. And then when the uh, manufacturer or the, the end users for them, uh, whether it be a large grocery store or a giant food company or something like that, calls them up and says, hey, we'd like to order your product, for example, green beans, uh, they will slap a label on it for uh, you know, the grocery store or for the, the giant company. And that's when it becomes a real product. Well, of course, if you get a can and it says green beans on it and you're, it's full of corn, you may or may not be very disappointed. So we have to look at these cans as they're coming down the line and verify that the correct ones, that the correct numbers or, or letters are available. Uh, if we get the wrong one, a lot of cases, it, we got a whole pallet load of the wrong one. So then we have to shut down the line they have to clear the line, peel off all the labels, kind of start again. But uh, this is just, again, more qual customer control, quality, uh, customer satisfaction. Another big area for us that uh, I, I'm going to call it manufacturing assist. Uh, it's not necessarily focused so much on the quality of the product, although that, that's kind of an, a part of it. Uh, it's more to make sure that the manufacturing line is working at its, its best level, at its optimal level, uh, continuously running. Uh, one of these applications that we do a fair amount of is uh, a flap detection. Uh, this is looking at your box of product, um, making sure that the flaps are properly sealed up uh, so that the uh, machine doesn't get jammed further upstream. Otherwise, if that flap's hanging out, you might have the uh, flap grab a hold of something and jam the whole machine up. So we're looking at these, this is, uh, if you look at it, this would be the top of the box on the left side and the bottom of the box on the right side. And we're just looking all the way around that corner to see if there's any anything sticking out of it. Uh, there is some customer uh, quality, you know, customer satisfaction kind of stuff there associated with it, but that's kind of the lesser issue. It's really more about the manufacturing line. Another area you're seeing more and more in the manufacturing space, obviously the robotic uh, guidance and robotic applications. Uh, robotics have been exploding the last several years in terms of um, uh, the numbers and the applications that they're doing. Uh, there are a number of companies that are now manufacturing food grade robots uh, specifically for uh, food manufacturing lines. Uh, this is an example of an application we worked on where the uh, manufacturer, this is cheese, um, they wanted their bags to be placed in a carton in such a way that it would be very easy for people in the store to pull it out of the carton and display it in the store shelves. They wanted it so all the labels are facing the same way. So in this case, they all say uh, mild cheddar cheese. They're all face up so that they're uh, you know, facing towards the consumer and uh, very easy to, to pick up and detect. So um, in this case, that as they're coming down the manufacturing line, um, the bags can be kind of wobbly, kind of wonky. So using the bag information really to find the position doesn't work very well. Uh, it does happen that uh, they run it through kind of a roller that flattens it out just before it gets to us. 
So the uh, text for mild cheddar cheese usually shows up pretty well. Uh, so we will look at that, uh, determine what the orientation is of the mild cheddar cheese. Uh, we're also using the very bottom of the bag, which happens to be a very um, rigid part of the bag, uh, to give us a really a much more precise angle for the bag. It tells us how, how what position is for the bag, uh, robot to pick it up. Uh, so then that guides the robot to the center of mass. Robot grabs it, picks it up, puts it in the box. This is another manufacturing assist application. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, cartons of liquid egg product. Uh, you may see these in the store shelves. You may use them yourself every morning. Uh, basically, it's a gabled standard like milk carton, uh, old school milk carton that they put a cap on it. So then you can pour it like a bottle. Uh, this is done with a machine that they refer to as the capper. And it, it basically screws these little caps on top of every one of the uh, uh, cartons. However, what happens is the capper will get jammed. And uh, typically what you see on the line, every, you know, once in a blue moon, you'll see a single one go down the line without a cap, which really isn't that big a deal. We shoot it off the line and, and they rework it. Uh, where you get into trouble is when the capper really jams up. Uh, the machine will be running. It'll be going down the line and making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products without caps. Um, so what we do is we put the vision system on there specifically to identify this cap. This is another uh, application for manufacturing assist. This is actually the evaluation. This is not off of the manufacturing line. Uh, what they're doing in this case is they're looking at the cartons before they fill them up to make sure they didn't get the wrong cartons loaded up. Um, you can see again, we have a, a 2D barcode, uh, or excuse me, 1D barcode. Uh, but this is only visible on certain packages. On some of them, the bar barcode is hidden and it's on the back side of the package. So on some of them, we use the 1D barcode. On some of them, we don't. Uh, very similarly to what we did with the uh, uh, pudding uh, tops where we're looking at them to verify the artwork. We do the same thing here. We find the position of the artwork. We verify that the correct artwork is available. Uh, some of these are very close in color to other ones. Uh, so then we have a lookup table. So we have all of these on one program. So then we can look up and see what's going on and select our, our characteristics for that package. Um, so once we change it over, it's going to reject and, and pass based on what it sees. This is another application. It's kind of in between manufacturing assist and quality control. Uh, the this is a pizza that we're seeing going down the line. I, I kind of tease that uh, I'm saving the lives of young college men everywhere by feeding them properly. Um, these pizzas are, are uh, coming off the line uh, and going into a wrapper right after this. And the big thing for the customer is that, or for the uh, my customer, the manufacturer, is that the pizzas are the correct size and in the correct orientation. If they come down the line and they're out of orientation a few too many degrees, it'll jam before it even gets into the machine. Um, if the other one is they get uh, something they call tabs, which are uh, pieces of extra pizza kind of hanging off the side. And if that gets into the machine, it will jam up the machine uh, and then, you know, shut down the wrapper, or shut down the whole line while they try to fix it. Uh, so really for their uh, return on investment, it was all about the uptime of the wrapper. And uh, that, that was one of the things we kind of struggled with early on. Uh, we, the operators were seeing pizzas get kicked off the line and they didn't like seeing pizzas get kicked off the line. But then they realized that the wrapper was staying up the whole time and they weren't having, and that's a big deal to have to go and fix the wrapper versus you know, get rid of some extra pizzas. Um, they do rework a lot of the pizzas, you know, they'll put them back on the line and, and or break off the extra tab and let them go. Uh, so this is an application that we, we've set up multiple times and works very, very well. Now, the one thing they told us when we did this application that we would never, ever, ever have to inspect the toppings. And of course, as soon as we had the machine in place for a few months, we uh, got word that they wanted to count the number, number of pepperonis. They'd switched over from uh, uh, pepperoni chunks to slices of pepperoni. Now, as a consumer of this product, uh, I know from personal experience that I'm very upset when I open up pizza and there's like two pepperonis on it. Uh, so what they do is they put the vision system on there and you can see it's counting 
uh, kind of the stacks of, of pepperonis all together. And it's telling you how many, approximately how many pepperonis have gathered. So if there's two in one clump or three or four or five, uh, in this case, we had it set up for a minimum number of three. I believe they're up to six now where they're, they're we started off at three and we've kind of worked our way up to uh, that six range. Um, and what happens on this line is the, the pepperoni slicer will break down and they'll start losing pepperonis and uh, you know, start getting less pepperonis. Um, the, and the big thing here is, is the customer satisfaction. Again, you know, as a consumer of this product, um, I don't like seeing just one or two pepperonis. I wanna see the full, full count there. Uh, and it really falls under the 110, 100 rule. I'm not sure if you're familiar, those of you who are not familiar with that rule, uh, it's basically, if you assume the product's worth a buck, it's uh, one times the cost of the product to reject it on the line. Uh, it's 10 times the cost of the product if you catch it before it leaves your factory. If it reaches your consumer, it's 100 times the value of the product. So every bad pizza you get with only two pepperonis, if it reaches the consumer, it costs you $100. And it costs you that in terms of the, the guy will complain about it on Facebook. He's going to complain about it to his friends. He's going to uh, uh, maybe not ever buy your product again, maybe buy a different product instead. So you've lost that customer forever. So that, that's really where the savings for the vision system come in. Uh, on this particular line, we ended up having to do, it's almost a multi-spectral system. We have one camera that's looking for uh, the shape of the pizza, uh, largely because of the sauce. If you see the edge where the cheese is kind of on and kind of off, we can't see the uh, sauce and then still see the pepperonis at the same time. So that's the way we, we take care of it is we have a, one camera that's looking at it in the red spectrum uh, for the cheese and the sauce. The other is looking at it in the blue spectrum for the pepperonis. Okay, so here's another application that kind of falls in between that quality control and manufacturing assist. Uh, this is a waffle inspection system. You may recognize these from breakfast. Um, these waffles are made on a line. It, it's almost done like an injection molding process where they fill the mold with the, the raw liquid uh, dough, uh, press the mold shut, cook the waffle, and then um, uh, put it out on the manufacturing line. Uh, in this case, you know, as a consumer, again, people don't want to see uh, half waffles or holes in their waffles or uh, weird things hanging off the side of their waffle. Uh, they want to see a nice, pristine waffle. Uh, at the same time, for the manufacturer, this goes directly into a stacking system, which puts the waffles into stacks of five or six and then puts those stacks into a box. Well, if you have uh, partially formed waffles or waffles that are too big that they jam the stacker up, um, that'll shut the line down. So they want, want these to be the right size, the right shape, the right appearance to go correctly into the machine. Uh, the kind of unique thing that we did here, um, because of the nature of the line, it's very, very difficult to put a, uh, a proc switch or any kind of trigger on the line to do the inspections. So we're doing what we call visual triggering. Uh, that means basically we're looking continuously until we see the product available. Once we get a good picture of the product, then we inspect it, make sure it's the right size, shape, et cetera. This is another inspection for pizza. We're looking at the raw crust in this case, and this is kind of an unusual application for us. It was a, a process monitoring system. Uh, what it was designed to do is basically collect a whole bunch of data and become a data point for the manufacturer where they were trying to figure out what affected the manufacturer of pizza crust. Um, this was going on an existing line. They didn't want to do a lot of modifications to the line. So this is really where we ended up developing the visual triggering um, that allowed us to take pictures continuously. We didn't have to mount proc switches. We didn't have to do any kind of modification to the line to make it work. We just hung some cameras and lights over the line. Uh, there's also a laser dot. You can see that right in the center of the pizza. Um, those are used to detect what the height is of the, of the pizza or the thickness of the pizza. Uh, but the customer, the end customer ended up using this as a, uh, a process variable. They ran it for several months uh, to gather data from the line and figure out what was affecting their process. There was no accept or reject uh, criteria on this necessarily. There's no mechanism to get rid of the pizzas. Uh, so we are showing passes and fails, but it really didn't shoot them off the line.
this is another application. And this one of the things that people talk about automation being really good for is uh, replacing applications where it's dirty or dangerous for human beings. Uh, this particular one is looking at uh, cereal, breakfast cereal, uh, as it's coming off the line. And what they had is they they call it a plow. So they drop this thing off. Uh, about four stories in the air. So the raw cereal product comes out of the machine. It's kind of um, moist and uh, um, squishy at that point. And they drop it on top of this conveyor belt, which is a, a large metal conveyor belt, uh, stainless steel. And then they shoot hot air up into the cereal to make it cook. Well, the problem that you have when you put it on this conveyor, if it's touching the sidewalls at all, the cereal will stick to the sidewalls and you end up with burnt cereal in the middle of your box or bag or whatever. Uh, if the cereal is too close to the middle in one big clump, all the hot air shoots around it and doesn't properly bake it. So then you get up with a soggy, squishy cereal. Uh, so what they have is a human being sitting there driving what they call a plow. It's basically a, think about a snow plow made out of Dalrin. Um, if the materials drifting more to the left or to the right. And what you're seeing here in this image, it's actually about a four foot wide belt of cereal. Um, you're seeing the extreme left six inches on the left camera and the right six inches on the right camera. Um, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep it right in the middle of the belt, keep it two, three inches, four inches away from the sidewalls and maintain that position. Um, this place is super hot and super humid. Uh, you know, I spent a day up there and, and could not wait to leave the place because it was just so uncomfortable. And I can't imagine for, you know, most operators, I had the option to leave and go downstairs, get a drink of water anytime I want. Most of the operators were up there for hours at a crack. So this is taking their position. And really, I, I don't think anybody was unhappy about losing that position or being somewhere else in the plant. Um, the other thing that they did with this, because they were able to really evenly distribute the product, they got a much better energy use. They were able to lower the amount of air that they had to push through the product in order to keep it looking good and working good and improve their product quality. This is kind of a newer application for us. It's a product quality or product counting, excuse me, visual counting. So what we're doing is we're looking at these products coming down the line. In this case, they're uh, little wooden dolls. Uh, that we were using for testing, but uh, the idea is to be using cookies or that type of thing. And we're making sure that you're getting batches that are a particular size. So if a manufacturer says that there are 20 cookies in this bag of cookies, if you open it up and count, there will be at least 20, bag 20 cookies in there. The way most manufacturers handle it now is they put 25 cookies in there just to be sure that there's enough and they're checking it by weight. Uh, but then the cookies, they're, they're trying to make them look handmade at the same time. So they vary quite a bit by weight and putting that extra product in there costs them money. So what you'll see as it's running here, you'll see it shoot up with little red lines. Those red lines are communicated to the positions communicated to the PLC where it draws a uh, drops gates down to separate out, separate out the products. So then we get exactly, in this case, we set the batch size to five. Uh, so we're getting five per batch and it will sort uh, separate those out further down the line. Uh, it also gives them the ability to uh, ignore certain product sizes or if it's burnt or you know you don't want to count that burnt one, you can let that burnt one through. So you'll see some of the small disks going through. They stay red all the way through the process, so those aren't counted as part of the batch. This is another what I'll call truly advanced machine vision application for the food industry. Uh, this is an image, if you've been in the, the vision business for a while, uh, you've probably seen these images before. Uh, it's hyperspectral imaging, which is just a fancy way of saying we're using different spectrums of light to be able to inspect the product. One of the things that uh, happens, there's a, magic, a couple magic frequencies of, of light where water will appear to turn black to the vision systems or to the cameras. Uh, one of those happens to be 1450 nanometers. I think the other is about 1700 nanometers. Uh, one of the cool things you can do with it is you can look at fruit. So this is uh, looking at an apple. The, both images are of the same apple, but you can see on the image on the right that there's a bruise present on the apple. Well, that bruise won't actually show up for several days, but because what happens with the bruise, it 
uh, accumulates water in the bruise on the fruit. So you can see that water, it turns black. Um, so because I had seen this picture so many times in my career, I thought this was surely a, an established, uh, well-used uh, technique that people were using. And I ran into an application where I needed to look at tiny droplets of water. And I said, well, surely this has already been done. So we went off and uh, pursued this application. And I learned that uh, I was kind of a pioneer still. Uh, you know, certainly I, this is two, three years ago. Um, you know, so the technology, like everything else, continues to advance. But a lot of the, I had to have uh, some friends of mine um, go out and make me lights, uh, shortwave infrared lights. Uh, they had to uh, wait patiently to get the, the small numbers of LEDs, shortwave LEDs that were available to make the lights, um, you know, put them together. I had to have uh, other friends of mine write the drivers. Uh, for the vision systems to make the vision systems work with the uh, it was a line scan shortwave infrared camera uh, so it, this is kind of an exciting new area but uh, you know be prepared to be a pioneer if you decide to, to go after it so this is another application um, this is looking at a uh, cup identification uh, this is kind of a standard looking at a cylinder coming down a line it could be a can could be a beer can could be a cup of yogurt could be anything uh, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to verify that you're using the right artwork on that cup as it's coming down the line. Uh, typically, the, the, this is done using um, multiple barcode readers. I've seen up to eight uh, ranged kind of in a circular firing squad around the product. Uh, the problem with that is there's two places where you really can't see the barcode, you know, upstream and downstream. So if the, the product is aligned just right, you won't be able to read the barcode. It'll kick it off the line. Um, and you end up having to rework the product or, or reintroduce it. Um, in this case, uh, what we're doing is we're using two cameras and we're using a new technology for pattern recognition uh, that allows for a whole lot of different patterns. So it can really quickly sort through those patterns, determine what cup is present based just on the artwork. So in this case, if we see the, the 1D barcode, facing towards one of the cameras, we read the 1D barcode and we're done. That, that's the end of the application. Uh, if it happens to be facing just perfectly aligned, so the cup, uh, barcode is heading upstream or downstream, uh, we then look at the artwork and say, well, is this a strawberry or is it peach or is it blueberry or what flavor is it? Is it the correct flavor? Great, we accept it and let it go down the line. Um, this is the, the company that I worked with on it. Uh, they do have a patent pending on it. I don't know where they're at in that process, but uh, certainly if you would like to pursue that, they would be the company to talk to. The other application you're seeing quite a bit of is uh, uh, deep learning. And this is something you've probably heard about deep learning in other industries, uh, the self-driving cars, for example, uh, doing processing of, of social media. They're using deep learning for that. And it's really a way of teaching computers to think more like human beings. Um, there are, my understanding, there are three primary ways to do it in the vision industry, um, you know, th that people are using. Um, you can lease those off of, of servers. You can buy the right computer and run it on a computer. Um, but these are things that are basically trying to set up vision systems to learn the same way human humans do. The way human beings learn to identify things is we look at it from example. So someone would show me, for example, a cut of meat, and this is an application that I've been asked to look at many times in the past, and I've always said no. We're finally getting to the point where the answer may be yes. Yeah, we can do it. Uh, so what we do is we look at these cuts of meat, and we, as human beings, we'll sort these out into different grades, these images, and then we teach that, that allow the computer to take a look at those images and learn the difference. So we might have 500 images of select cuts of meat, 500 images of choice cuts of meat, 500 images of prime cuts of meat. And then we'll let the system chew on that, learn, learn by itself what the difference is between those cuts, and then go ahead and start doing sorting. And then when we have the when the system makes a mistake, oh, well, you know, it grades it incorrectly. We'll take that image, we'll add that to that additional image database of 500, so now we have 501, and it will learn that information. Uh, so a lot of applications that maybe five, 10 years ago, 
uh, you were told were impossible because it, you know, that's human level intelligence. They may be available now, impossible now. So what do I hope you've taken away from all this? Uh, first of all, automation in the food industry is continuing to grow and continuing to accelerate. Uh, we are seeing more and more applications in that industry, and I expect that uh, most other manufacturers and vision integrators are seeing more as well. Uh, I think you will continue to see an update on the machinery and the technology as well, even without vision systems, uh, driven by the economy, driven by the availability of labor, people are going to be automating, you can't avoid it. Uh, the Food Safety uh, Modernization Act will drive some of the quality initiatives and the tracking initiatives. Uh, at some point, the government will start enforcing that law. And at that point, I think you're, you're gonna see some panic in the industry as people race to try to catch up. Um, also, I think you're gonna see on, on a lot of these lines, they're running so fast right now, uh, human beings literally cannot track them. We cannot uh, impact them. If you could make a thousand bad products in a real hurry and a human being would never be able to see it because they're just a blur running down the line. So again, that'll that'll drive some of it as well. And then I think with uh, the green movement, uh, you're gonna see an efforts to reduce scrap. Uh, companies are bragging about how little scrap they produce. Um, you're gonna see some of the greenwashing on the products that you know say we produce so little scrap that you know it's we can put it in one dumpster a day, something like that. Um, those companies that are, are trying to promote that, the best way to reduce their scrap is by detecting um, that they have a problem immediately, shutting the line down, fix the problem, start it back up again. Um, so the, I think that will also continue to push customers forward. And with that, if there are any questions, please feel free to contact me. I've listed my email address and cell phone number below. Typically, the best way to reach me is via text messages. Uh, I kind of get vision blinders when I'm working on an application and don't hear the phone ring and may not check my email for days. So uh, if you send me a text, I will try to get back to you as quick as possible. Uh, I am a vision geek, so if you have any questions about vision in general, I love talking about this stuff and happy to help you out. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation and hope you enjoyed it.